Ladies and gentlemen, our event this evening is co-sponsored by the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School, by the Kennedy School Black Students Caucus, by the Black Students Association at Harvard Undergraduates, and last and least, the Program on Constitutional Government in the Government Department. Our speaker tonight is Shelby Steele, Professor of English at San Jose State University. He's best known for his book, The Content of Our Character, which was published in uh, 1990. The title, The Content of Our Character, is a famous phrase from Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream. I have a dream my four little children will one day live in a nation where they no will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Today, Martin Luther King is America's best known black. We now have a holiday for him at last. So he has official recognition, but he's not America's most fashionable black. That is Malcolm X, Martin Luther King's adversary. It's interesting that he did have an adversary. You all know the recent uh, film by Spike Lee, Do the Right Thing and how it ends with two quotations diametrically opposed from Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. It makes you wonder whether the black experience is one thing. When you first hear about philosophy and go to study it, you discover to your amazement that there are many philosophers with conflicting ideas and you begin to doubt that philosophy is one thing. And yet somehow it is one thing. So too with black thinkers. It's not only Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. All the major black thinkers have disagreed with one another. Frederick Douglass opposed those blacks who wanted to colonize the American blacks. Martin Delaney, Edward Blyden. Booker T. Washington spoke against Frederick Douglass in his famous Atlantic Exposition Address in 1895, the speech which made Booker T. Washington's reputation. He ended with a reference to our beloved South. That was in opposition to Frederick Douglass's bitterness against the South, the land of the slaves. And then, of course, W.E.B. Du Bois spoke against Booker T. Washington in his books, the book, The Souls of Black Folk. There's a chapter, as you know, of Mr. Booker T. Washington and others in which he accuses, accuses Washington of being too submissive. And Martin Luther King, in his time, was opposed to black Muslims and to the black power movement. Indeed, there's no agreement, agreement even on the name for blacks. Colored people, Negro, black, Afro-American, African-American. All these are honorable names associ associated with different black thinkers and black movements. And we white folks try anxiously to keep up with correct usage. Now, this evening, in the spirit of constructive dissent, or any kind of dissent, because somehow to think is to disagree, we also have Professor Randall Kennedy from the Harvard Law School, who's the editor of Reconstruction Magazine, and whom I know from um, the President's Committee on Free Speech. So now, to turn over the um, um, a meeting to Shelby Steele, I announce his title as Civil Rights and Wrongs, The Politics of Virtue. Professor Steele. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me figure who I'm arguing against tonight, but, but I do agree with that. Uh, 
the substance of that uh, introduction, that uh, dialogue is healthy and good. Um, I'm going to come at my title tonight uh, a little circuitously. Um, I hope to say something about civil rights and civil wrongs, but um, you may not notice it as we, as we go along. Um, what I really want to talk about is a, a concept I'm working on in my uh, next book uh, called Mismatching. And, um, but before I get into that idea per se, I would uh, like to talk about the ways that, at least I feel, uh, both whites and blacks in America have, or at the, at the current time, characterize their involvement in the racial issue and in the problems revolving around race uh, and the social policy that, uh, that comes out of, uh, out of that. So what I, and because I think, again, this idea of mismatching grows out of the, those two uh, very different characterizations. Um, and that mismatching really has, has evolved over the last 30 years as the way um, whites and blacks in America have negotiated racial, uh, racial matters. Let me begin with the, the white uh, characterization, which for lack of a better term, um, I, I'm still working on it, so maybe I'll come up with a more elegant uh, uh, phrase for it. But for the most part, I, I call it the ignorance characterization. Um, and let me say this, first of all, both of these characterizations, and I think both blacks and whites, um, are grounded in actual truth. Uh, the truth of their experience, their racial experience. And yet, at the same time, I think they are also tactical in that they enable both races to avoid primary and serious areas of culpability. Um, and um, so at any rate, I think the, the, the experience of whites in America, for the most part, is an experience of not knowing very much about race. Um, we have historically lived in a segregated society where the races have been separate. Uh, even today, uh, there is a great deal of, of segregation in one neighborhood and another neighborhood. And so it is a fact that, uh, that whites um, uh, are, are born into this condition of not knowing really very much about this deep schism in American uh, society. Another part of it, I think, um, um, best be exemplified by a film I saw not long ago um, called Shoah, which is a film about the Holocaust, a documentary, and I recommend it over Schindler's List, by the way. I think it's a, uh, an absolutely great um, documentary film. And there is a scene in that film where um, a Polish peasant who owns the farm right outside the gates of Auschwitz uh, concentration camps, uh, the same Polish peasant owned that farm when the Holocaust was, uh, was going on. And every day as he worked his fields, he saw the train loads of Jews going in to the, into the camps, obviously not to, to come out. Um, and he's still working those same fields now, or at least when the film was made. Um, and the interviewer asked him a very interesting question, the obvious question. Well, you were, here, you were here then. You saw that every day. What did you think? And his answer was, he held up a single finger and said, well, their finger was bleeding, not mine. Um, and I think as brutal as that may sound, it's absolutely true. Uh, he was not on a train. He was not going in. He did not know fully and comprehensively the experience of the people who were on the train and the group uh, who was that was designated to be on the train. Well, this is a part of the, I think, the existential fate of whites in America. Their finger was not bleeding. Uh, they did not and could not really, uh, in a sense, know. And so in that sense, the ignorance characterization, I think, uh, is, is grounded in truth. On the other hand, um, I won't go into this in great detail, but there is also, I think, in white America, has been what I call a kind of nurtured thoughtlessness. 
about race. Uh, a whole system of, of, of ways that uh, white Americans have historically um, achieved an ignorance about racial matters. Well, I don't know. There were never many in my high school. We, it wasn't talked about much uh, around the, the dinner table. There was one I used to know who lived uh, so-and-so, but we never, um, and uh, so it's not, I just don't know much about it. Um, well, a lifetime of those kinds of denials makes for uh, a rather substantial ignorance, uh, an earned ignorance. Um, uh, a kind of close, and it's again very inconvenient often for white to know, uh, and so I think this is a part of that that ignorance. Also, <clears throat> something else I think that is that is a part of the fate of being white in America is that one is born into a certain racial impunity that others do not have. Um, and this impunity, this, what, racial confidence, this sense of being um, almost a universal people uh, is gained for whites by the enforcement of a boundary of stigmatization by which all other people are stigmatized in negative ways, with inferiority, with the whole uh, long list of, um, of stereotypes. And so, in a sense, this impunity that whites have historically enjoyed in American society um, is uh, the result of other people carrying stigma. Um, and so the sense of fuller humanity, uh, again, is the result of other people's lesser, uh, lesser humanity. Um, and the great gift of being white in America is the ability to live without stigma, to meet people in the world without having to go through that barrier of stigma that applies to one's, one's uh, group. Well, I think this is no mean advantage. I think it's a um, uh, it's something certainly that people who have, who have to carry the stigma uh, want very much for themselves uh, to be encountered in the world simply as human beings. Um, uh, who belong here? Who, uh, whose society this is? Whose country this is? So, <clears throat> um, again, I think there are many examples of this white impunity that... Uh, uh, I can remember when I was uh, uh, young, very young, I'll emphasize very, uh, in the 50s, um, uh, when uh, Russia invaded Hungary and uh, my parents, uh, through our church, took in a family of Hungarian refugees uh, who were very delighted and happy, ecstatic to be taken in. Uh, by us, and of course we treated them lavishly. I never ate so well. Um, but it took them about two weeks to realize that they were living with black people. Um, and this came as a shock to them. And they, but it only took about two weeks. Um, and then they too knew already this truth about American life. Um, and they left our family and uh, found other uh, another place to live, and even though they lived in the same town until I grew up and left home, they never spoke to us again. Uh, well, they knew what was what. They were white, and um, it wasn't going to really do them much good to be living with blacks in a black community. Uh, why take that on? So right away, they, uh, they, they left and found... Uh, took advantage of the impunity that comes to white Americans. Um, <clears throat> I think that for whites, again, there is a deep, much deeper than I think we, we often realize, a deep tension between this claim of ignorance on the one hand 
um, and this knowledge of impunity on the other hand. And the clash, well, I don't know anything, and yet I do have this impunity, I think makes for a very profound tension and specifically a profound guilt in white America. Um, and I think that it is a part of the condition of being white in America that it is not something that one chooses or does not choose. It is a matter of fate. It is simply there. And I think it is a great uh, and powerful force. Um, and that this guilt draws whites into a kind of an approach avoidance relationship with race. You know, one minute we're ignorant, the next minute, gosh, we better pay attention. And there's this, this tension you see, whites coming forward, going back, um, and that this, I think, has been underrated um, as a force in American life uh, and underrated as a um, as a source uh, of our social policy making in regard to race in America. And I think this guilt has been obviously a great deal more profound in the last 30 years than before that, where it was suppressed and there was a segregated society. Since then, <clears throat> it has become, I think, one of the, if not the major source of, of uh, social policy making uh, regarding race. Let me now move to blacks and the way they characterize uh, their involvement in race in America. And their characterization, I think, also obviously comes from the truth, comes from the truth of their experience of race um, in America. And just as whites use ignorance to hide from their impunity and their guilt, blacks, I believe, claim that their primary, for the most part, their primary difficulty in American life is racism and racial oppression. And just as this is obviously true, I think it also enables blacks to avoid another very serious problem, which uh, is the deficiencies that we came out of a period of 300 years of oppression with. Uh, and let me say a little bit more about that, because I think it's often overlooked. Um, you have to remember that black America, the, the culture, everything, was formed in a, there's no other word for it really, than a crucible of oppression uh, that went on and on and on, 250 or more years of out and out slavery, another 100 years of of um, brutal uh, racial segregation. Uh, that was the experience we lived in. Um, and our goal, obviously, was to survive that experience. Um, and in that crucible, I think we developed many, many talents. We showed enormous ingenuity and creativity, uh, or else we wouldn't be here. Uh, today, and we did survive. Um, I won't go into all of those, those talents. I'll mention a few. I think probably the best discussion that I have ever read, certainly, is uh, Ralph Ellison's uh, book of essays called Shadow and Act, where he delineates uh, these things in a slightly different context than what I'm talking about tonight, but they're there. Masking, for example. Uh, if you're a slave, boy, you better learn how to wear a mask. Uh, as one scene in Ellison's novel, Invisible Man, where he, uh, one, uh, going to all the details of it, one black says to another, uh, you know, you never tell a white man the truth. You always lie. Are you, are you so stupid you don't know? We always lie to a white man. Um, even if the truth helps us, we find a way to, uh, uh, to lie. Um, you wear a mask because it's, it's, if you can make him think something other than what is, the difference between the two is your freedom, is your margin of freedom. Uh, and if you're no good at masking, then you're just vulnerable to him. You're vulnerable to the oppressor. And so we developed that as a talent. There are many examples of it. You think of Louis Armstrong, um, who uh, wore that mask, that big smile, and the, the 
sweat and the handkerchief and the so forth, uh, this mask of humility that white people bought. Uh, well, actually, Armstrong was a very serious artist. All sorts of innovations uh, in, in, uh, in the trumpet uh, and in the blues. Uh, and in bringing that kind of music that had been primarily folk music into a much more sophisticated uh, mainstream venue. Well, in order to practice his art, he had to wear that mask. And the, again, the discrepancy was where he found the freedom to be an artist. Um, Several years, decades later, we have Miles Davis, who, who wore another kind of mask, who turned his back on the audience, uh, uh, but also used the mask to, to win for himself that space in which he could be creative. Well, we, again, one of the, I think, ingenious talents. Uh, one, I'll, I won't mention all, but I'll mention one other, which I think is often overlooked, and that is that I think we had a profound talent for social protest. I don't think there's any group in, in, in America who can, who's anywhere near what we are in the art, the practice of social protest. Um, most of the forms of social protest that are in civil disobedience and so forth that are now practiced by many other groups, all the way to Tiananmen Square, uh, came from the civil rights movement, which was not just a movement of, of outrage and anger by blacks, uh, but was a very carefully orchestrated uh, movement that won um, a great degree, a degree of freedom for people who were outnumbered 10 to 1, and won uh, that freedom uh, for the most part nonviolently. Uh, it, was, it took genius to, to, uh, to do that, uh, nothing less than genius. When you see that, uh, if you've probably seen in the eyes and the prize, that little girl seven years old or so, who's walking up the steps to the school in the South to integrate the school, you also notice that there was not a single black adult near her. She was made to, to, uh, to do it alone, and the TV cameras are right there to catch it. And so uh, she was surrounded by two tall, white federal marshals. Uh, her vulnerability was uh, emblematic, the vulnerability of the, of the entire race, and the, the moral truth was there, um, and America's moral conscience was touched. Uh, well, that's a very sophisticated kind of, of use of, of the media and of, of scene and, and drama. Uh, so we had, a, I think, an enormous talent in that area. On the other hand, what happens when we begin to get freedom, when we get greater and greater degrees of freedom? Well, all of those talents, all of that ingenuity that we mastered over three centuries of, of segregation begins to become obsolete the greater degrees of freedom we gain. Um, what good is it going to do to mask when you're free and you don't have to lie to the white man? Um, what happens when uh, your problems now are infinitely more complicated and can't be reached by the techniques of social protest? So I think one of the things that's been over uh, or underestimated in the black American experience is that freedom was one of the most traumatic events in our history because right alongside of freedom came this degree of obsolescence. Certainly not absolute, not 100%. But so much of what we had devised, had learned, uh, became obsolete as we, as we became uh, more free. And at the same time that that, was, that absol obsolescence was, was going on, we had for 300 years been living in oppression and had not had been allowed to develop the kinds of skills, attitudes, value systems that one needs to thrive in freedom. Uh, in 1938, a black was lynched, I think it was in Georgia, for painting his house. Um, well, that does a lot to encourage individual initiative. Um, a slave who believed in the ethic of hard work 
would be an idiot, wouldn't he? Um, so all of the, again, the, the crucible of oppression was trying to make us, to condition us into being slaves, it was not trying to condition us to be free people. And believe me, it was a form of very effective social engineering. Uh, we did not have the opportunity, we're not allowed to have the opportunity to develop these skills to uh, individual initiative, to see economic possibility around every corner. We see other immigrant groups come in today and boy, they see economic possibility no anywhere. Well, uh, economic, if we had seen it in the days of, segre of segregation, or certainly before, uh, we would have been at very high risk. So it is not surprising that we do not have a long history and tradition of these skills, these attitudes, these value systems. How could we? Uh, it would be, if, if we did have them, then, it, then we weren't oppressed. But we certainly know we were oppressed. And so this has been, I think, a, um, a profound liability for us, this obsolescence on the one hand, these deficiencies in, with regard to freedom on the other hand. I don't mean to draw this in an absolute picture. Obviously, many, uh, there was a long, um, there was a, a black middle class that goes back all the way uh, deep into the 19th century, if not before, and where many of these things uh, were uh, uh, learn, but I'm, I'm talking in very general terms. Well, given that trauma of finding oneself in, in greater freedom, but not quite knowing what to do with it, the temptation is to go back to what one knew, to, what, to one's talents, to one's ingenuity, and to take that, those old talents that we had and apply them to modern problems. Uh, I think a perfect example of this was the um, March on Washington that we had this past summer, which was a commemoration of the 1963 March on Washington where um, Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Um, and so this summer we had a, a, there was a commemorative march. Uh, but now, what was the focus of the march? Was it, you know, this, a new civil rights bill? Was it a, uh, overturning the horrible institution of segregation? No, the focus of the, of the march was more jobs. Well, if you think about that for a moment, who's against jobs in America? Everybody from the president, from both parties, everybody wants more jobs. There's no debate. Maybe we don't know how to get them, but we all want them. You know, it's not as though Clinton is sitting in the White House there and he knows he's got all the secrets how we're going to get more jobs, but he won't let it out. And if we have a march, maybe we can manipulate his moral conscience and he will tell us how to get more jobs and he'll all be happy. No, I mean, the problem of joblessness in America, as we all know, is enormously complicated. There are many variables, greater glo global competition and so forth, the, the rise of the Japanese. The, I mean, we could, we'd be here all night listening, listing uh, the various causes of joblessness. You can have all the protest marches you want. Um, well, wrong, a technique that was ingenious at one point becomes obsolete um, at another point. Um, and what we result, what we end up with, again, <clears throat> is what I call a mismatch. And so let me move to this business of mismatching. Um, I think in its simplest, in its simplest uh, sense, mismatching is when we agree, that is both whites and blacks, both sides of the, of the uh, spectrum, agree to explain minority difficulties clearly arising from the, the, the inability to make freedom work for us as if those difficulties were the result of oppression. Um, well, again, joblessness. Um, joblessness is not, is as painful and horrible as it is, it is not an instance 
of oppression. It's something else. It's many things. There may even be a little oppression in there. But there's only one variable among many variables. And so when we say um, that it is, um, has to do with the oppression of blacks, certainly, um, we've mismatched. And uh, that becomes a problem. The cardinal rule uh, of mismatching is that minority difficulty and suffering is always a result of oppression. <clears throat> so that if you go to a public school and the black students are having a difficult time, or you go to a college campus and, and uh, there are not a lot of black faculty there, the temptation is to say when we're mismatching, well, clearly that's racism, that's oppression. In fact, it may be any number of other variables. But when we instantly and reflexively assume it to be oppression, uh, we have mismatched uh, and um, made it something that it is not. Uh, mismatching is when, again, oppression is the only prism through which we look to explain minority difficulties. Uh, we never look through a, the prism, prism of freedom, which in if you don't know how to take advantage of freedom, can be more oppressive than oppression was, can be more demoralizing than oppression was, because now you don't even have the, the oppressor to blame, and can be more self-defeating. So uh, again, freedom is, um, for people who long for it, uh, sometimes we're, we're a little um, idealistic about it. Freedom is really a very difficult condition to live with and to thrive in. Um, and <clears throat> again, when we say our difficulties are oppression, we avoid that. There is an activating mechanism to mismatching, and I call that mechanism the gloss of oppression. When you gloss or paint a person or a behavior or a group as oppressed, um, whether or not their difficulty has to do with oppression. Uh, so again, if we see those uh, the black students are having difficulty here and we say, well, it's oppression. We've glossed them with oppression uh, when in fact their difficulties may have to do um, with other things. The gloss of oppression is a powerful tool, I think, in American life. Uh, and it tries to set up a moral relationship of obligation and entitlement between the races. If I'm having a difficulty and I explain it to you and I say I'm oppressed and that's why I'm having it, then I entitle myself and I obligate you. And so the gloss of oppression really is about a power relationship. It establishes a power relationship. Um, relationship. It is whenever we gloss things with oppression, we are in a sense making a bid for power. Um, and that is why I think uh, it has had such a uh, pervasive effect um, in our political and social culture in America. Uh, for example, I think now that it is really the gloss of oppression that, des that defines the difference between conservatives and liberals. Liberals are people who, who are quicker to gloss with oppression and say, oh yes, that's, uh, that's an instance of oppression, so we've got to bring the system in to do something. Conservatives are more reluctant to gloss with, with oppression. They are, they are more open to, to other explanations, maybe the explanations of freedom, of, of, of difficulty dealing with freedom. Um, but uh, that is, it's the gloss of oppression upon which those, those two political categories pivot. Um, <clears throat> I'm always called a conservative. I never knew I was a conservative until I began to publish on race. Um, but obviously what I wrote about race uh, very often said some of our difficulties are not due to oppression, but other things conservatives. 
Uh, if I said, on the other hand, well, you know, operate entirely by the gloss of oppression, or largely by the gloss of oppression. That's the key. That's what establishes the power relationship. That's what entitles blacks. That's what obligates whites. And you either operate by that gloss, or we have no use for you. You are not even black. I think it has become so pervasive, uh, really, at this point, that is, it is not, when we talk about what the black identity is, in many cases, it is no more or less than identification with the gloss of oppression. Talk to young people and, and older people. Well, what is it? You want to be black. Well, what do, you, what do you mean? You get one reference after another to oppression. You don't hear about the jazz artists. You don't hear about the great uh, cultural achievements of blacks very often. And you hear about the oppression. Well, that's, that's way, the way we, I think, uh, too often uh, <clears throat> play the game. But I, and again, I, it's, it's uh, I think, a, a, a pervasive part of the American political, political culture now is this, this impulse to, to gloss with oppression. Well, we can see what's in it for blacks. What is in it for whites? What's in the gloss of oppression for whites? Why do they go along with it? I think the reason white America goes along with it is because when you gloss somebody else with oppression, you also gloss yourself with compassion. Um, and that answers what I talked about earlier in terms of this, this tension, this white guilt coming out of white impunity and, and uh, knowledge of white impunity and ignorance and, and uh, the, the guilt that results. This answers it. So if I'm white and I say, well, that kid over there is oppressed, I'm going to treat them that way. I'm a compassionate guy. Um, and I win those points in America's racial game. Uh, and so there is, I think, a symbiosis between white and black blacks um, in America. In other words, there's something in mismatching for everybody. And it has become pervasive because of that. A couple quick examples. <clears throat> Recently at the University of Pennsylvania, black students took over the confiscated, confiscated uh, copies of the student newspaper, clear violation of freedom of press. Uh, well, boy, if white, if, if white students had done that, that, that's a big deal. That's a serious uh, violation. They would have been obviously probably very severely reprimanded. The black students were not. Well, why not? Well, my sense is that the administrators lost the black students with oppression thereby glossing themselves with compassion and said, it's OK. And that was the end of that. Everybody got something. The blacks deepened their sense of entitlement. And the whites administrators got to feel that they were good people as opposed to bad people. I think even a more horrific example of this uh, was, you, was seen in the, the riots in Los Angeles when the, te the, the television reporters who, who rushed up <clears throat> looking for gang members to interview. Um, that was a hot, you know, ticket, was to get a, a gang member, you know, with the right color and so forth. And, and then, of course, you ask him about his oppression. And you ask him, what, what is it like? How bad is it here for you? And uh, isn't police brutality, you know, what, tell us a little, tell us a little about police brutality. And of course, he would, he, on cue, would do so. 
Well, suppose you, 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 you remove the gloss of oppression for one moment. Suppose the reporters removed that gloss for one moment. Stop just getting compassion easily and, and, and so forth. And looked at the gang members objectively. Wouldn't it make sense to ask them a simple question? Isn't an initiation right in, in your gang having to kill somebody? And isn't it also true that 99.9% .9 of the time when you do kill somebody, you're killing another black? And isn't it true that you have a lot more black blood on your hands than the Los Angeles Police Department? And isn't it true that, you're, that people here are more terrified of you than the police? Well, you don't see those questions asked because if the reporter would have asked the question, he would seem to be not compassionate. He would seem to be cold-hearted and judgmental. One of the tests of this, this kind of compassion is that you can't judge. So you see them there, blood on their hands, but you can't say that. It has to, it has to uh, if you do say it, you're a racist, you're judgmental, um, and so forth. Well, I think this has become a dynamic in American life. And <clears throat> you see it in all sorts of situations, I, in, in the, the, the terrible tragedy of the AIDS epidemic. I think we, we see it even there. Uh, <clears throat> as terrible uh, as that uh, epidemic is, very often in the media, uh, and you see these award shows, and you see them all come up to the podium, and, and they've got the red ribbon on and so forth. Um, AIDS has been glossed with oppression. And therefore, it becomes an opportunity for the rest of us to show compassion. We're treating it as though somebody plotted it. Well, of course, AIDS is a virus. It's a terrible thing. We ought to do everything we can do to end it. But it's not an instance of oppression. You can wear pink ribbons all you want. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and to, to gloss it that way is to mismatch um, and make it something that it's not. A couple other quick examples here. I think both Dan Quayle and Bill Clinton got in trouble for the same reason during the last presidential campaign. Uh, Quayle came out in the riots and he made his famous family value speech, created a national sensation. Uh, of course, there's probably not anybody on any side of the political spectrum that would, would uh, um, have any qualms with the substance of the speech, which was that obviously family values would be helpful um, in this community. Um, but Dan Quayle got in trouble because he did not gloss that community with oppression, and therefore he was seen as a white man who had no compassion. And, that, and, and so again, the substance is lost because of this overriding symbiosis that we had. Bill Clinton got in trouble for the same reason. He told Sister Soldier, he sort of rebuked her and said, it's, you know, it's not nice for you to say that, well, we kill uh, so many of our own people, we ought to spend a week killing white people. He said that's an irresponsible statement. Probably most of us would agree that's an irresponsible uh, statement. But we had a white man who refused to gloss this, this rapper with oppression. Uh, and therefore, he looked to be compassionless. Um, and Sister Soldier was suddenly on the cover of Newsweek magazine. Not because of what she said, not because of what Bill Clinton said, but because he had not glossed her with oppression, had held her to account. And when you hold a black to account, you are compassionless or, or seen that way. And so we had a national sensation. Now, of course, I'm cynical enough to believe that maybe Clinton knew exactly what he was doing, and he was showing himself not to be compassionate in order to win certain segments of the, the, uh, the uh, blue-collar Democrats, as they're called. Uh, but nevertheless, he couldn't have done that. It wouldn't have worked as a strategy unless this larger dynamic of mismatching was at work. Um, 
Well, I think political correctness generally is an insistence on glossing things with, with oppression. Um, you know, we, we, we even now gloss language with oppression. You cannot say girl, uh, demeaning and so forth. Uh, but I think one of the, re the real reasons for this is that if I don't say girl, or if I don't say black, I say African American instead, what a wonderful opportunity for me to show my compassion, to show myself to be compassionate, be concerned, and not wanting to be hurtful. Um, well, again, I think that there is something rather selfish in that kind of compassion. I think it is a form often of uh, not always, but often of self-gratification, where the, the, the preoccupation is much more with one's own profile of innocence than with this other person. With not, and the, the other person then becomes an opportunity uh, for my very, 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 very easy display of compassion. I think our social policies in America have come out of this. Um, and I think our social policies revolving around race have, had, have, have been grounded in two elements. One, separate standards, and two, group preferences. Um, and I want to make clear, I don't have anything against these things in themselves. What I don't like about them is that I think they are outgrowths of this symbiosis. They are ways in which both whites and blacks have avoided their true culpabilities. Uh, in American society. Um, it is very easy, for example, to give people a preference at the age of 18. It doesn't cost a lot of money. They can go to the right, they can go to, to college. Very easy thing to do. Um, very difficult to give them a good preschool, a good elementary school, a good solid education that would, would pay or would help them uh, develop so that they can compete on equal terms. Uh, and so we have this entire focus in, in, in our racial reform in America of an emphasis on an equality of results, uh, where we're going to engineer the results no matter what. Whether there's real equality there beneath it or not, we're just going to make it look like it's, it's equality. It's, again, the glossing of oppression. Blacks then get used to that kind of entitlement. Whites get used to that kind of easy compassion. And um, again, the problems go on, they fester, and no genuine reform um, really takes place. I think that real compassion occurs when you love somebody enough to ask them to pursue their full potential, the kind of compassion that we always uh, show our own children. I love you. I love you too much to not hold you to account to some standard of excellence. And if I did, we, don't we always say that as parents? And if I didn't love you, I wouldn't ask you to do that. But when we, again, come into to social uh, uh, relations and across the races, that kind of compassion disappears and there is no accountability held. Um, and again, it, I think, becomes a kind of selfish, self-centered sort of easy compassion where I certainly, as a black, often feel exploited, like I am an opportunity for white compassion. You know, kind of opportunism in it. Um, rather than being sincerely cared about. Well, um, you know, it's the straggler in the foot race, who is, who is behind. Um, you know, do we feel compassion for him or her by saying, well, you, you can run one less lap than everybody else in the race? Or do we show compassion by cheering him on, by saying, you got it in you, uh, by helping him practice more, by telling him what it takes to, to really develop the kind of speed to participate in the race? Um, because I don't think we can, as a society, show genuine compassion unless we love speed itself. And yes, we, unless we love excellence itself. And any display of compassion outside that context is pity. 
and selfish. Um, and I think in the long run, very, very, very unproductive uh, and divisive uh, and um, not at all something that, that brings us together um, as a society. I think, I'll finish with this, I think um, the first goal of American life and social policy regarding race ought to be to stop segregation and, do, and uh, in, in all of its forms, in whatever way we um, can do that fairly, to simply stop the practice of discriminating against people on the basis of race, gender, ethnicity, whatever. Difficult thing to do, but no more difficult than what we're doing now. Probably easier to do. Most, in many, I, I'm convinced that many American institutions don't even know what real discrimination is. Um, and we answer it by just sort of having preferences and, and well, I've taken, taken care of that. Um, but in order to, to, to not have real discrimination, you, all, you first of all have to know what merit is, what excellence is, what you're rewarding. Because that's more important than the individuals involved. That's how we all know ourselves. And if you start fiddling around with that, the society, the culture gets lost. And we wonder why, what happened to our education system? Why, are, why is everything dumbing down? Well, you, we can't have it both ways. We, we, we've got to, I think, um, again, get, you, you end discrimination by getting in touch with reaffirming uh, standards of excellence. Uh, as far as blacks and minorities, what we really need is development. We need honesty from white people. We need to know, I've talked to business executives and they say, well, you know, what can we do for the, the, the new blacks that we hire? You know, do you think we should give them a separate lo executive lounge? <clears throat> I say no, but I, what I will ask you to give them, and you probably won't do it, but what they really need is inside information on how to get ahead in this corporation. What does it take to really get ahead and make an impact in this corporation? Well, I can't give that kind of information. I, I'm hoarding it. Um, <laughs> well, I don't need an executive lounge. That, that, that's a place you go if you want to be out of the loop. Um, we, we need development. We need the same thing everybody else needs. Um, in American life. We need good education. We need high skills. We need um, uh, to understand how the economy works, to understand how you make a business uh, turn a profit. Uh, the same sorts of things everybody else um, in, in this, this society uh, needs. We don't need this symbiotic uh, process of, of mismatching and forever uh, uh, operating out of an oppressed model. I'll stop there and take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the address. I agree with various points that uh, you made and I agree with um, your objection about being labeled in ways which allow people not to grapple with uh, your arguments directly. I think that you've been subjected to a sort of ad hominem attack that uh, is not very useful quite often. But uh, it's also the case that um, while there are reasons why people have criticize you quite harshly for the wrong reasons. I think that there are ways in which you've been criticized quite harshly correctly. And I'd like to spend just a moment um, <laughs> pursuing that. I think that one of the reasons why um, some listeners of, some listeners in your audiences and some readers of your, of your book and of your various essays are really quite critical of you is because they feel that even though they agree with various of the points you make, for instance, the idea that 
all of the things that befall you know, people of color don't directly come from direct racial prejudice. I think a lot of people read that and agree with that and various other points that you make. But there is one thing that I think really sticks in the craw of people, some people listening uh, to you, and this sticks in my craw. And that is that um, you talk about oppression, first of all, in the past tense. And second of all, you, in my view, minimize it. If it's true that there are people who exaggerate it, and that needs to be on the table, and that needs to be criticized when that is so, I would also contend that you really um, minimize it in a quite, uh, a quite pronounced fashion. For instance, throughout much of your talk, you spoke as if the real problem with white America is that white America is uh, drowning from a surfeit of compassion. <laughs> now, I think that, frankly, we are still in the era of Ronald Reagan and that it cannot justifiably be said that the main problem with white America is that it suffers from too much uh, compassion. You mentioned the situation at the University of Pennsylvania and you mentioned Sheldon Hackney. Frankly, I agree with your criticism of, uh, of uh, former President Hackney, I really do. But Sheldon Hackney is not characteristic of uh, the uh, officialdom, either in the private sector or in the public sector uh, in the United States. Uh, it's not the case that the, what confronts black Americans day by day, guilt-tripped, shaking uh, white uh, Americans. Um, they are not, as you indicated, you, you mentioned this, but you, you didn't emphasize it enough. You mentioned, you know, who was being wooed in the last election. It wasn't the Sheldon Hackneys that were being wooed. It wasn't the people who were uh, suffering, you know, who had this uh, compassion mania that you criticized. Rather, it was people who, in a shrinking economy, uh, feel threatened, who feel threatened because of the loss, large, in, in some large measure, of their privilege, that people who feel anxiety that they are seeing a world slip away, a world that has been characterized by the hegemony of white men, and they feel anxious about it. I think that that, more than that, is the um, central thing that I think that we have uh, to uh, confront. You said over and over again that uh, blacks aren't being held to account. Blacks are held to account. I think that uh, this last thing that happened, let's bring on this last controversy. Louis Farrakhan, Nation of Islam, I'm with you all the way. I think that uh, the comments that were made, that people have talked about, were reprehensible and terrible. And I don't have any truck with it, and it should be condemned as far as I'm concerned. And the fact of the matter is, it has been condemned. The editorial pages have been tearing Louis Farrakhan and the Congressional Black Caucus up. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's fine. But let's not forget about it. It has happened. It has happened. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, we have a whole sector of white officials in the public sector and in the private sector who over a long history have done atrocious things and they are not being held to account. And that is a big problem. So I'm for, um, I again would like to emphasize that on certain things I agree, but I think on the, on the question, and it's a very important question of emphasis, I think it's the, it's the matter of emphasis that brings to you some of the, um, much of the criticism that you talked about. 
I think, yes, we need honesty. Yes, we need some of the things that you, you mentioned. But more than anything else, uh, what oppressed people, and I still use that word, oppressed people in the United States, and there are various sorts of oppressed people, including oppressed white people, what they need are resources. And I think that much of the discussion has to be a lot more concrete. And what's missing, actually, from our current president and his predecessors is a willingness to funnel resources to the people who need it. And that, I think, stems from uh, dynamics that uh, your talk mentioned, um, but all too lightly. Thank you very much. I didn't take notes. I should have taken notes. Uh, I don't know where to start. Um, well, I'll start at the end. You said something about um, resources for people who are oppressed. OK. Um, I'm all for that. Um, uh, whether they, without any regard to race, with, with regard to need. There, there is, and you rightly point out, there are many people in America in, in need um, um, aside from black people. I think, though, you missed my point. My point is that because white America and its institutions, its leaders particularly, have been able to practice this very shallow, disingenuous form of compassion, uh, none of those resources have been forthcoming. And my biggest complaint about things like affirmative action is that they are ways that people buy, the society buys its way out of meaningful social reform and social development. I don't care about it. I, you know, it's not a, I'm not going to launch a campaign against it. Uh, all I do is point out the fact that we, as, my, as a minority, have been had. Uh, I mean, by this, this disgusting, shallow, insipid, fatuous form of compassion, which is piteous and demeaning to us um, as, as a people. And we now, ironically, are invested in it. The number one agenda item of the NAACP in its last convention was affirmative action. Not uh, teen pregnancy, not better schools, but affirmative action. <clears throat> so again, I think, I think that we've, we've bought, you see, my point about compassion is that we have settled as, as black Americans for this very shallow, easy kind of compassion. And we have not demanded from America genuine compassion, uh, which would cost more money, which would be more expensive, which would take more effort and more time and more courage to genuinely uh, tell us the truth, Tell us what it takes to live in a free society, and then support us as we, uh, as we work to, to, uh, to live and thrive in that kind of society. Um, there are all kinds of, uh, um, you know, we, we see, I, I come from California, where the great infusion of, of um, uh, people from Asia uh, who very quickly uh, do very well in American society, and of course I know it's very inappropriate to compare ethnic groups. I only do it to make the point that they too are discriminated against. But they come with all of these, these things in place, these attitudes, these uh, ways uh, of, of handling and seizing freedom that we, the very nature of our oppression, as I tried to point out, kept us from working there. I remember my father used to, used to uh, talk about, well, you can put some money together with so-and-so down the street, and, and they're going to form a co-op. And of course, they're, they're saying, I'm not going to, I don't trust him with, uh, with my money. Well, of course, the Koreans get together and put their money together. We've got a problem. That's part of our oppression uh, is the, of, of trust. This is real. This is true. This keeps us back. Um, this has nothing to do with anything to do with Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking America for real compassion. Uh, not this phony stuff that, that, that uh, 
we keep getting in and we get invested in and we think our whole life depends on whether or not, you know, there's, there's a, a, these, these preferences and, and different standards. And then we get into this whole ideology of what is really a standard. Not ever, uh, and we defeat not only ourselves, but we drag down the entire society. The society drags itself down. Uh, and then we wonder why. This is all the, the decline that we see in America today, I think, all comes out of our inability to be honest about race and really confront this problem. I, and I criticize everybody, left and right. I guess I'm supposed to take questions from microphones. Well, Up here. Um, in your speech, you said that a lot of the techniques we developed through this crucible of oppression that we live through are now um, you know, void or they're, they're no longer applicable because our situation has changed. But I don't really hear you prescribing or talking about any new techniques that may be developed given the political culture that we have today. It seems like everything you cite is still exogenous. You say that you know, black people are always looking you know, for handouts and affirmative action, but then you say that perhaps our, our way to develop is to get an uh -huh. honest assessment of our capabilities from whites or that we need development. And I was wondering, can you cite any things um, or any techniques that we can develop on our own without this kind of paternalistic relationship that you seem to be citing when you say that we need true compassion from whites? What things can we do endogenously? What new techniques outside of masking or, I don't know, um, sit-ins can we use to develop today? I was just wondering what your thoughts mm -hmm. on those were. Real structural things, not, mm -hmm. you know, these more education. Well, or okay. Um, that's that's more. I didn't get the last part, but whatever. Um, well, I, it just you know, seems blade on the way out. But go it, ahead. It, no, it just, it just, no, 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 no. It's, it, it just seems like everything is really broad. I mean, in your speech, you cited real structural things like masking. You can't tell a white man the truth. And sit-ins. Those are structural. Those are techniques that we use to change the structure at a certain point. Sure. And then you cite these broad things. Everyone needs more education. Everyone needs. You know, mm -hmm. development economically, but what things, what techniques are applicable to our situation today? Okay. All right. Let me try to um, answer that as best I can. Um, you know, I, th I think that uh, I, don't, I don't believe in magic, um, and I don't believe that there are, that you know that there are any tricks. I don't believe that there is any you know form of magnificent social engineering that we've not seen before that is going to just do the job. I think what we need are what all human beings need in the modern world. We need a good, stable family life. We need children who are well-loved and well-raised and well-educated, who have skills, who understand that success and prosperity in the modern world come from ingenuity. Uh, let's get some engineers out there who can, can create a new engine to make a better car and sell more than the Japanese. That's the kind of thing we, in other words, we need to join the American mainstream uh, in the way it's always been joined um, and make our contribution, develop ourselves as individuals. There's, again, nothing that I, can't, that I can sit here and say today that everybody doesn't already know. We just have to do it. My point is, when you, are, when you are continually glossing yourself and your people and your condition with oppression, you can't see the forest for the trees. You can't see the most obvious things. And so we, we get all kinds of social engineering, and we fall further behind. Um, that's what we've got to give up, give up this, this idea that our, uh, even if we are, continually being oppressed. We've still got to do this. We've still got to refuse to define our entire fate and existence uh, and situation in America on the basis of oppression. Otherwise, we, we, have, we, we have no option other than to be dependent and then rely on this kind of empty compassion from the larger society. So that's, uh, that's my point. Uh, yes, Dr. Steele. <clears throat> uh, not really a question, but just a comment. Basically. I like questions now. You know, much better than comments, because I gave a speech and he gave a speech. Uh, so it's well, better if uh, you just I'll, ask me a question well, and I can answer. It's, well, it's not really a question, because basically I agree with your, your philosophy. 
My okay, own. Okay, you can make a statement. My <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> enough said. Well, in my, uh, my situation, I'm 50 years old. I grew up before affirmative action. And uh, I grew up in a basically black middle class family, quote unquote, whatever that means. Had a two parent family, mother and father. They're still together today. Worked, raised me in the work ethic taught me right from wrong, kept me in church from the time I was knee-high to a duck. And like you just said, it was basically just common sense. But I decided to turn away from that, and I came up during the area of de jure segregation. And I decided to turn away from that and do my own thing, which led me into crime, drugs, the penitentiary. And I had to basically go all the way down, and in there I went through the whole rhetoric during the 60s and the 70s of do your own thing, let it hang out, and, you know, press Black Panthers and the whole nine yards. I went through all that, and I understand all that, and I see a lot of that. We still have a residual overflow of that today. But the bottom line was I had to finally realize that the bottom line was if my world was going to change, I had to do it, and that there was a responsibility on my part, my part alone, no matter what anybody thought, and that my greatest enemy and oppressor was myself not some system, not some country, not some white man or anything else, because I wasn't going to let anybody think that they were superior to me by me admitting that they were holding me down. So basically, I just took the impression, the, 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 the opinion that if I was going to succeed, I was going to have to take the initiative. Well, once I made that commitment to myself, without looking for anybody's false compassion, as you stated, I never looked at it like that, the world didn't change, it's just as racist as it always was. Oppression is just as real as it was 20 years ago. But I change. When, when I change my attitudes, I stopped going to jail. I stopped shooting dope. I stopped walking around with my fist up in the air. And I literally went from being a junkie in the 60s to working on a master's degree here in the 90s. So basically, you know, and it doesn't have anything to do. Like you said, people say you're a black fundamentalist and conservative. What's that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it's just, to me, it was just common sense. Is what mm -hmm. I knew all along was being yeah. right, and those values hold across the board, be we black, white, or polka dot. I agree. So, that's all it, I want to say. I appreciate that. It is common sense. I'm tempted to let you keep going. Um, I want to build on the brother's point that spoke first. You've come and you've suggested a lot of solutions that black people need, and it seems to me that all your solutions revolve around us requ requesting assistance. They all seem to have us going to the mountaintop to find the truth from the white man. And it seems very odd to me that if you suggest that there is so much freedom and that this freedom exists, why we have to go to others to seek that freedom and to realize that freedom. And why not speak to black people from a point of self-empowerment and building from within and, building, and, was, building, and building upon the structure we have? I think when you suggest that we have to ask white people to be honest with us and tell us the truth and to seek that from them, it seems like you already are. You, well, let me, you, let me put I'm this. I'm not finished. I just would like uh, to finish. Well, go you're, ahead. Not, you're not believing in the fact, you're kind of assuming the fact that we are inferior. And we need to ask to have the light brought to us. OK. Do you really think I think black people are inferior? Well, I'm not saying it's just what you speak. No, but, but you what, just what you said, said that. Do you really think to that? Me that you, what you said implies to me that I would have to go and find the truth from someone else. Mm -hmm. So before I went to a brother, an elder of my own, and asked him what the truth was for me to find out what it is to be a black man, I okay. would have to go to a white man to find All right. the truth. Let me, let me answer you this way. You know. Uh, I would be ready to find the truth anywhere from anybody I could find it because I want the truth more than I want some little petty racial victory or some idea that, you know, I'm, I don't need a white man, some, some sort of racial machismo. Uh, that doesn't mean anything to me. I need the truth. I need to know how to get ahead. I need to know how to make it in this world. Why can't I so I'll take the truth person, from then? from I'll take the truth from black people, from red people, from whoever has it. 
But that's not what you suggested. That's just what I you, said. You had not said that at one point in your entire presentation. Your entire I said, presentation I, I, revolved around well, finding solutions. Let's, let's don't go around in circles. I, I, I said what I said. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Whoever is next. Um, you suggested um, during your talk that, that what characterizes the left in America right now is sort of a, a, a consensus that blacks are still oppressed, and one might add to that women or any other um, this, you know, less enfranchised mm -hmm. group. And I was wondering if you think that perhaps the reason for that is that there is a lack of consensus within the left and a lack of discussion in the left about what um, equality looks like would mm -hmm. look like in America, mm -hmm. um, and that simultaneous to that, the right has sort of, is also participating in not, not having that discussion and saying, um, okay, yeah. every, we, are, we just reached equality. This is it, sort of, the, mm -hmm. it's, this is it. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you think that we, maybe we need to discuss that more. Oh boy, I think we need to discuss a lot of things more. Um, and I think one of the difficulties the left has today is the, the very poor quality of discussion. Uh, the fact that, you know, we, we pay such a hard or such a high price today for uh, any degree of honesty. Um, and so people don't say things. And issues like equality don't mean, are not meaningfully addressed. Um, we, we come up with these sorts of, again, ideas about, you know, uh, hierarchies and hegemony. And, and, and we create these... Uh, you know, these images of unfairness, you know, excellence in any form. If you, if you look at, uh, again, to use my example of a foot race, uh, it's hierarchical. Excellence imposes a hierarchy. Is there anything wrong with that? That's good. We want a guy, we want somebody to lose the race, don't we? We don't, we don't, you know, look forward with, with uh, insidious pleasure at somebody's loss, but we, we also want somebody to win. We want to see what human potential can be, how fast a human being can run. And so there is no disgrace in losing if one is given one's all. Um, and uh, the equality comes in at the beginning of the race. They all start at the same line. Uh, I think in society, we have to have equality of opportunity, not equality of results. We're never going to have equality of results. It's not possible. We don't really want it if we think about it. I'm not sure I answered every aspect, but let me move on here. Yes, um, you've, Mr. Still, you've spoken about trying to get at the truth and dealing with things honestly. Um, I want to attempt to contribute something to that. Uh, the gentleman that spoke before over here, the African American older man, older man. He mentioned the fact that he was around before affirmative action. Well, let's speak honestly yeah, we're about, about the same age. Let's, so well, <laughs> we're watching that. well, just a brief comment on affirmative action. Let's, let's deal with that honestly. If you even reduce it to gender and racial preference, that's been going on for hundreds of years. The most recent example is FOBs, Friends of Bill. I mean, this whole thing about affirmative action, we need to really understand this whole thing about preference that's been happening. And, for, and the issue it started to become a volatile issue when we started to expand affirmative action beyond the scope of white males to include women and minorities. Now that's a big controversial issue. We just want to close that in. Affirmative action only applies to women and minorities. That's the first point. And so I think that the second one is that you, in your initial opening comments, you didn't make much of a distinction between race and being a member of a race. For example, you talked about how white people were pretty much ignorant about this notion of race. I would offer that they may be ignorant about what it is like to be a black person in America, or Latino, or Asian, but I think they know a tremendous amount and maybe, may even be experts on what it means to be a, white, a member of the white race in this country. They may not be willing to want to confront that and talk about it honestly in terms of the privilege that comes with being a member of that race, but that they do know what race is about in terms from their own perspective. And you did not make, you, and you, you claim that they were ignorant on race. So could I get some remarks on that? Well, um, sure. Um, you know, my point is that because I don't, as I said, I think this ignorance is a nurtured thing. It is, it is an ignorance that is achieved. Um, and, and I didn't get a chance to go into this because uh, I'd have been here talking all night. But, but um, the evil of racism is that, when, is that racism invisibilizes our humanity in the interest of our convenience. So if I want to say that uh, I don't like you because you're white, then what I've, what I've really done is used your race to invisibilize your humanity. 
racist love race, sexist love gender. They've got all kinds of ideas about gender difference, about racial differences. They think they're just everything um, because they use race to invisibilize each other. This is, this is the evil of it, is that they invisibilize our humanity. My point is that we are all human and that any white who's ever been rejected and that for whatever reason, and that probably amounts to all of them, with very little imagination can imagine what it's like to be black, to endure that kind of racial rejection. Racial rejection is a universal human experience. Uh, what I'm saying is that whites um, choose, work very hard at, at not really seeing their, the human connection to blacks. When they, if you see the real human connection to me rather than our racial um, uh, connection, which is in, at this point entirely politicized, then I, I give the example of the five or eight year old boy who's in this, this South Central Los Angeles and has a, has a, a mother, no father, goes to a, a, a terrible school and bullets are flying and so forth. My point is that child's the least of, of his problems is the fact that he's black. The, the, the problems that he has are all of these other things that we all know that uh, not a good enough family life, not a good enough neighborhood, not a good enough school, not a, so forth and so on. Those are the problems. Um, and so I, because whites are so preoccupied and so tense around race, they in conjunction, in symbiosis with whites, will very often look at that boy and say, well, his problem is he's black. Well, I'm not saying he has no problem uh, because he's black. He probably does, and there is racism and there is discrimination in this society. But I truly believe in all my heart it's about 15th on the list of problems that he has. He needs love. He needs guidance. He needs people who care about him. He needs a community that's safe and so forth and so on. Okay, this is the last one. I guess. Oh, no, I gotta make this good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't disagree more with that last statement you just made. I think the number one issue is economic discrimination. And you keep talking about truth, truth, and being candid and honest, but the crux of your whole argument rests on this ridiculous myth about some so-called preferences for minorities and women in the society. Now, the truth is now people can say anything they want to say, and we've all heard those ridiculous stories about how some, so, uh, some uh, white male with a PhD in engineering was passed over for some, uh, some uh, woman who had a seventh grade education, et cetera, et cetera. They're all lies, you know? <laughs> There's not a single case, documented case in court where that sort of thing has ever happened. There is a long line of cases, and I'm sure Professor Kennedy probably is familiar with them all, like uh, there's the Hicks case, the Patterson case, the Watson case, uh, the Hopkins case. There's a whole bunch of cases. There's been a whole bunch of studies. There's been a whole bunch of studies. You need to ask a question They did a case study in Chicago. The Urban Institute did a series of studies where they sent one person to apply for the job, the same qualifications, the same personality, the same dress. Second, per another person went to apply for the job. The, uh, the You're 100% uh, the, right. I agree. There was a case. Let me let yeah. finish yet. There were cases right here in I Boston. Agree. Right here in liberal Boston, with Bay Bank and Fleet Bank and a whole bunch of other banks routinely discriminate I agree. in terms of mortgage rates. I agree. I got the point. I agree. Stop. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me stop the flow for just a moment. I agree. Okay. There is racism. I have experienced it. I experience it almost on a daily basis in this country, just like you do. I I, I am no 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 different than anybody else. All I am trying to say to you, listen to me now, listen to me. Don't gloss your entire human fate with oppression. Thank you. <laughs>